All righty. So let's let's dive in. Hi. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for joining uh, this session. It is titled, What is User Journey Mapping and Why Should I Care? Uh, my name is Chad Hester. Uh, the link for the slides is both in the chat window as well as on this slide. I'll, I'll share the link for um, the slides at the very end uh, on the last slide as well. Don't forget to please add a uh, evaluation if you can. If you have any questions as we go, I'll take a look at those after the presentation. Please have uh, those qu questions prefixed with the letter Q, a colon, then whatever your question is. So that way I can skim through and grab them. So let's get started. So again, my name is Chad Hester. I am a web developer for now over 20 years. It's, wow, just such a flash. Uh, I've been working with Drupal specifically for about 12 years. I primarily focus on information architecture and UX, uh, and that's been my main focus for the past 10 years and growing. Uh, I'm a big advocate of open source software and uh, user experience. Uh, I encourage community participation and learning. So that's hopefully what we can cover today. Of course, since this is a remote DrupalCon, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, this is my pet's first DrupalCon as well. Uh, please meet Teddy, Spike, and Jet. So really, is this a presentation for you in particular? We want to be sensitive to that. Uh, so the topics that we do want to cover, the questions that we rather want to ask are, what is user journey mapping? How can this help me improve user experience? And is that the same thing as user stories or user personas or user flows? Let's dive in. So we want to first focus on improving user experience. And this presentation actually is born out of a bit of confusion. I've had peers and uh, colleagues sometimes confuse user stories, user journeys, flows, personas as kind of meaning the same thing. And they're, they're not. They're, they are actually very specific terminology in UX. But I understand why people would be confused. Because from an English language standpoint, they almost seem like synonyms in, in certain contexts. That makes sense. There's some empathy there. But let's dive into it. Uh, user experience research is imperfect. We're trying to improve and grow. Uh, we want to create empathy. And through that empathy, uh, we, we target research. We target uh, you know, any sort of exercises that help us grow our understanding of what it is that we can improve. So because UX is such a large field, Try to focus on where you personally can participate. I'm much more technical uh, as, a, as a person. I, I come with a development background. So for me, I focus a lot on information architecture, but that might not be your experience. You might be an event coordinator or someone with some sort of background that might be you know, more empathetic than I am as a person, and that's fine. Try to use those skills. Uh, there's a, a link at the bottom of this slide. You can come back to it uh, later on if you want to try to dive into this. And there will be a lot of links throughout this presentation. So uh, just uh, visit the slides later on if you'd like to see those. So let's talk about user journeys. So user journeys are really comprised of a couple of different things. But really, it's about a person's experience as they go through something. It could be as simple as I you know, uh, book a room at a hotel. I talk to the concierge about uh, local restaurants and other fun activities in the area. I, you know, enjoy my room or don't. <laughs> I enjoy the pool or don't. And that's part of my personal journey. That's something that has different touch points. I had conversations. I visited a website for booking, maybe had a phone call. All of those are, are parts of my journey. I have feelings and thoughts through each step. And your experience could be different than my experience. And that's completely valid. So the difference with user journey mapping is compiling different user uh, journeys that different people have, focusing very specifically on different personas. Again, these, these archetypes, these uh, types of representative portions of, of groups, audience segments, if you will. And trying to create a distilled construct that tells us what general use cases are, what experiences are. And then it maps that out in a way that we can share, explore, and even change over time. A lot of times they will align with things like conversion funnels or just general activities 
that may go beyond just a website. So what are user personas? And how does the how does user journey mapping relate to user personas? Well, user personas are about trying to define and represent an audience segment. Uh, this can and should, if possible, study real users, or if you don't have the ability to get in touch with real users, which really shame on us all for, for being in that position where we're thinking of that, but sometimes it happens and that is valid. Sometimes you have to just method act as that character. Now, relying on that and making design decisions on method acting is not advised. So that's why you hear so much caution in my voice. You want to compare the experience of different audience segments. Sometimes it could be something like, um, maybe I have a university website where there's an application process for student um, loans. Well, is that the same for in-state versus out-of-state? Does that matter to the experience? And if it does, then you probably want to sub-segment out and study the difference to better understand that experience. Maybe it's great for in-state, but you're having terrible conversions for out-of-state. Well, explore that because the website's not the only place that those people are touching. That's part of that journey that we want to explore. But personas are something that we can take a look at. And we're really just trying to ask a lot of very specific questions to try to better understand audience segments, like who they are, what they do and don't like, what motivates them, what frustrates them, decisions they can make, how they relate to you or your organization and what it is that you have to offer them. That can help build a construct of a persona that makes sense to the design exercises that you're trying to do. And don't just make a persona for the sake of making a persona. Make a persona because it's a tool that you're using in your process. Otherwise, you're just wasting your money. <laughs> so how do you create that persona? Well, start off with the easy stuff. Get some demographic information. Take a look at analytics. If you can run a survey or if you already have run a survey, take a look at that. Look for the trends. If there are any sort of customer feedback logs, if, for example, there's a customer service facing email or portal or even phone logs, any touch point that you have with your user base is an opportunity to learn. I'll probably say this again, but learning is your primary currency. You want to fail early, not late. And the only way to do that is to learn. Take a look at the behavior patterns, use different tools, and there are an abundance of tools to take a look at data as well as model things. And also you wanna pay attention to things that might drive decision-making, like how much money a person makes can tend to shape the sort of decisions that they're even capable or willing to make. So a lot of times we will start off with a fictional person. Um, I, I like alliteration. Uh, so Michael member, because we do a lot of work with uh, association clients. So I might call Michael member the, the primary individual member. And we'll take a look at a few examples like that. Give them an age, an occupation, and a salary. And that should be based on real data. That way they can better represent the majority case. Now it's okay to come up with fringe cases, especially when you're trying to design for people in those fringe cases. That's completely acceptable. But you do want to create these personas to help use them as a tool and carry them through these exercises. And when you're taking a look at things like goals, motivations, even a bio, you don't wanna just come up with some outlandish thing like this is a ski instructor. And so, unless you're running a ski resort, resort, that doesn't really matter. Try to keep it focused on what it is that you're studying so that way it's more applicable and it helps guide the design research. And learn if you don't know. So we have a handful of uh, personas here, just all lined up so that way we can kind of copy these things into other exercises. And they're tall for a reason. They don't have to look like this. This is just one of many possible templates that you can use. They don't always need to be this detailed. A persona, it really the amount of detail depends on how you want to use it. But minimally, you can take a look at some of the key attributes. We have some sort of a, a, a picture of some of these people you may notice that there are no women in, in any of those pictures. And is that a problem? Are you accurately representing what the data shows you about these people? Or do you want to add uh, more diversity to this to help better represent and, and design for that? That is a decision that you need to make as a, as a designer early. And that's an ethical decision. Uh, give them a name, define what audience segment they're a part of, you'll see that I have age, location, occupation, and various other components to comprise this persona. And that's 
what personas really are. It's just putting together some sort of a composite to represent somebody. Now, you can keep drilling down into audience segments. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but start usually with the high level segments to better understand that and then you can drill down. So what are user stories? So user stories are not the same thing as user journeys. Uh, they can influence each other and they are a component. Uh, this is one of those premises of uh, user acceptance testing and agile development. I'd highly encourage at least trying a little bit of it. There's a fantastic book on the subject called you guessed it, user story mapping. <laughs> it's a fantastic book. If you read only the first chapter, you'll be in great shape. And a lot of times user stories, again, are just asking certain questions, but it's really specific. And a lot of these individual tasks can grow up into what we call epics, or they can drill down into um, even more specific tasks. And the, the common format is who is doing a thing, what are they doing and why are they doing it? That's more the long form. And a few examples in, are, are included here. You know, as a high school student, I want to apply for a student loan so that I can attend college, which is different than as a parent, I want to apply for a student loan so that my child can attend college. And those subtle differences help you understand use cases that you want to design around. So that's that's the long form exercise and there's nothing invalid about that. In fact, a lot of times these help with things like acceptance criteria. So what is user story mapping? Well, it's taking that idea and putting a lot of those user stories on post-it notes and putting them up on a board and then trying to organize them into logical groups. A lot of times those groups are grouped by persona. A lot of times very large groups like uh, an e-commerce experience or uh, reading publications, they start to develop what are called epics and those will bubble up to the top. But if you wanna learn more about that, there's plenty of material on the subject. Um, the biggest thing that I love about that is it helps us carve out what's called a minimum viable product. It's that blue line that you carve. So anything below the blue line, are more than nice to have the lower priorities, anything above the blue line, you gotta have this, this thing can't function without it. And that takes a team to figure out where the blue line is. You put the blue line in the middle of the thing and move the post-its above and below. So one tip that I'd have for doing user story mapping is, is keep it short uh, when you're doing that exercise. Uh, simple verb noun pairs are really great, like apply for student loan, read course description. Yes, it doesn't include the intent, like why they're doing it. It doesn't even necessarily include the persona, and that's okay for a quick mapping session, but your fidelity is, is all about drilling down into that. Just a bird's eye view can tell you a lot of information. So user flows, how is it different than user flows? Well, user flows are what a lot of times, um, a lot of us are used to with process flows or, or some sort of sequence or decision tree sort of thing. And, this can include everything in a single system typically. It helps you just understand the set steps in a sequence and where decisions may happen. And mapping that out is really important. Uh, a lot of times very early on and, and you don't necessarily need to have personas or journey maps or things like that ready to be able to successfully make user flows. Uh, a type that I personally prefer is uh, page flows. Uh, these. Or, or even wire flows, these, these representative pages that help with visual cues, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, I do advise doing user flows before user journey mapping because it kind of steps into it in a reasonable way, uh, lets you see the granularity of a certain process. And sometimes you can improve a system pretty quickly by seeing, okay, I have five steps here. This might get confusing here. Let's go test that. Yeah, this is this is too much. So they, you might simplify a few of the pages or micro interactions that you might have in a process. So again, we asked questions about this to help with the activity to drive it. So where are you starting? What choices can you make? Uh, what happens next? And what's the goal? So some of the, uh, the illustrations here, I forgot to mention, come from an organization that we worked with at Unleashed Technologies called um, the National Guard Association of the United States, or NAGUS as they call themselves. And you can see here, there, there are a couple page flows that we have. Really, the, the question in the upper right hand corner, which you probably can't see because it's microtype, <laughs> a lot of these diagrams get very big, uh, but it's asking a question about very specific things. 
how do I become a new member? So you can go through the menu system, you could go through a search page, but ultimately you get to a point where you see different membership types. You may take a look at the membership benefits and sometimes we'll add notes here uh, to help illustrate things that we might want to improve over time. We'll also annotate things to get the, the text out of the way of the diagram so you can more clearly see how things are diagrammed. Here's just a few more. That was about new members. This is about renewals, which is a different process for this organization. Again, there's some potential improvements we could have there to the process. Uh, this is about event registration. Again, a different process. Uh, this is about writing to Congress, which involves an iframe from a different system to do the writing to Congress sort of thing. So are you feeling lost? <laughs> there's a lot that we're covering here. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if you feel a bit lost. So maybe watch the recording and see if you catch something that you didn't the first time. So these things are different, but they do work together. So personas, they help describe an audience segment and they are used in exercises. Uh, stories help you really find a very specific task and what the use case is for that. Story mapping helps you see the whole litany of things that you can do for a project. It doesn't mean that you're beholden to that. It just means that you're surveying the land and figuring out where's that line? What are we doing here? And user flows are very important to visualize some sort of a process, how to build and improve things. User journeys are your experience, what you specifically went through in an experience. And user journey mapping is taking multiple people's experience for a specific persona and trying to understand that. I know we haven't looked at user journey maps, but just before we get to that, I wanted to at least illustrate similarities and differences, why you're choosing to do these things. So let's talk about mapping a user journey. That's why we're here. So to create a, a user journey map, I would highly recommend coming up with a common template. And you can use different templates over time, that's fine. There are a lot of templates online, or you can just build your own. Personally, I like using Lucidchart, you can use Illustrator, there are a few other tools that you can use for that sort of thing. Uh, find out what persona pertains to the user journey that you wanna focus on. And then describe the basic sequence of tasks, and that's where those user flows can come in handy. Now, a journey map is not just about what am I doing on the website, and we'll take a look at that in a bit. It could be a conversation you have, an email that, that was sent, some sort of a phone call, maybe looking at a site that you have no control over, and then they come back to your site. Maybe your website has nothing to do with the user journey, and that's fine. But the point is, is that you're studying something. Maybe it's a conversion funnel, maybe it's some sort of a large activity, but it's something large enough to understand something as a unit. And we'll look at that in a second. Uh, touch points matter too. So we just talked about that. Phone calls, emails, websites, newspapers, TV ads, all those things are touch points. But this is where the empathy comes in. You want to graph emotions and thoughts. You wanna make sure that you capture that. And that really should be coming from real commentary that people are having. This is uh, user surveys, user interviews, just make a composite of, of the trends that you're seeing to put together an experience. So how do you create it? We're getting there. <laughs> I want you to operationalize this. I don't want this just to be theory. Um, so you want to try to find some of the recommendations from stakeholders. Where are most of the difficulties that you're experiencing as an organization? What have the users said? Um, and try to understand what the conversion funnels are before you get into it. You don't have to do user journey mapping for every project. You, sometimes it's not helpful. Understand the value that you're trying to add. What are you capable of improving? Conduct user tests. Try to validate any assumptions you have. You can be wrong and you want to be wrong as early as possible. User stories can also try to help explore things uh, themselves. User flows help model those sort of improvements. Um, and also this can inform ideas for your backlog in agile development. So again, questions, learning from empathy. What is this? Is this for me? Uh, how does this make me feel? Do I want or need this? Why do I want this? How do I do this? What do others think? Those are the sort of questions that you wanna be asking yourself of other people when you're putting together a journey map because that's what they should be telling you. 
So good examples. So we have a couple examples we're going to look at. Let's get right to the, where the rubber meets the road. So I have a generic example just to kind of give you a light touch and we'll go over that. And then I have some examples from um, Nagus. So the, the simplest example here uh, that we're taking a look at, I, I got to enlarge my windows to read this microtype. So I assure you, I can't read it that well either. <laughs> but let's dissect this. On the left, you have the persona. So you remember that from our earlier slide where I had multiple personas. Well, I'll just copy that and I'll paste it into this different template. And you can have your different approach, that's fine. Uh, at the very top, you'll see that there are three distinct areas. Um, so this is mapping a conversion funnel. So you have three different points. You have awareness and discovery. I'm, I'm not aware of this thing, now I am. How did I become aware? And we'll get to that. Uh, interest and consideration, that's where you're mauling it over a little bit. And then evaluation and conversion. I press the button, I do the thing. From top to bottom, at the very top, you have some thoughts or some feedback that corresponds to the different points that you see below that. All these things are vertically aligned for a reason. Uh, below that, you see kind of more of a task or a process that they go through step by step. And they those steps go across these uh, boundaries of the different phases of a conversion funnel. So you'll see, for example, reading the conference brochure. Well, what did they think when they read that? And what was the touch point? So the touch point might just be a physical paper brochure. That's fine. Do you have influence in improving that if somebody doesn't like your brochure? Do you know that people don't like your brochure? Well, here we see that the person had a positive uh, sort of feeling, if you will. They're excited about the conference. At the bottom, you see a trend line going up and down between the green and the red. And sometimes an emotion is kind of neutral. That's fine too. There's nothing invalid about an emotion. You're trying to just learn from that. You'll see that they go to a website, they have conversations with colleagues, eventually they might go back to the website to register. And all these involve potentially different user flows. So registering for an event is different than learning about an event. That, that could be separated by months of time and that's again, valid. So you can see here that this might actually inform points where we may want to help bolster up their emotional state where we can have influence to try to drive things forward. Now, on top of that, uh, we with Nagus, we, we really talked to uh, a lot of stakeholders there, but we also tried to drive into um, actual real world feedback from people about their experience in different areas. So in this case, they have the concept between individual members and uh, 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 corporate members. So we'll take a look at both of those, but this is the idea of, an individual member joining. What is their process? Who are they? How are we representing them? And that's different than a corporate member joining because they're joining as a group, not as a single person. And there are different financial implications. There's different ways that you market to such people. And in this case, we're also depicting the renewal process, which as anybody that's worked with any sort of membership based organization will know the renewal process from a conversion funnel uh, standpoint is different than trying to attract new people. It's, you know, the difference between new and add-on sales. And again, they're different touch points. They're different thoughts, feelings, steps in the process. And we want to honor that. We want to understand that and explore that. So we can certainly have done uh, many more user journey maps for this organization, but these were the ones that really stood out to us. Event registration, really big for an association. That's where a lot of revenue is driven. Take a look at the Drupal Association. They certainly know. And uh, we did a great job making this uh, a virtual event as a, a way to compensate for what's going on in the world. I do want to hang on this one uh, in particular. So we're taking a look at a process that someone that works with the media did. They, they came to the site after seeing some articles on uh, the Nagus website about a very specific political issue, you know, bill going through Congress, that sort of thing and uh, saw some things in the newspaper, on TV. But you'll notice towards the bottom here, their emotional state steers negative. So the, the point that I wanna have here is when a human has a negative emotion, that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes that's a prompt for action. And in the case of writing Congress, in this example, um, this persona, uh, Maria Media, she's writing Congress because she's upset about something that prompts her to act. Now, we don't want to deliberately make people upset for the sake of action, but it's important to understand that 
uh, a negative emotion is not always necessarily a bad thing to a process like this, trying to prompt somebody to act. Another user journey that we took a look at was just their email newsletter sign up. We went through the process, we studied it, and we got stuck at a certain point where we were being asked to take a look at uh, signing somebody up, you know, the consideration phase of this conversion funnel. And we noticed there's no example of the newsletter. Why am I going to sign up for something that I can't see? So that was our advice from, from just taking a look at this journey map. I mean, it's a simple change, but what a, what a bold change to be able to influence somebody's decision. So those are user journey maps. Those are just a few examples. I would highly recommend taking a look online and taking a look at a few different types of examples of journey maps. That's just a template that I tend to use. There are tons of different templates that you can have. So continuous improvements, because you want to learn as a person. I actually wrote an article specifically about the learning process where there are distinct phases. Maybe you came into this session not even knowing what user journeys were or what user journey mapping is. That's okay, you were in the unknown phase. Maybe you've only encountered them or maybe you're acquainted, read a few blog posts. Maybe you've really studied this stuff. Maybe you're super experienced or maybe you are a master. Just know where you are in the learning process and honor where that is. And, and if this stuff is useful to you, your clients or your peers, then it's kind of your responsibility to go through this path. Uh, I, I can't remotely consider myself a master of this, but I am experienced with it. And I'm, I'm glad that I've had many mentors along the way to help out with this. And that's the next point, find a mentor, find someone to help you with this stuff, attend social events, you're doing that now, you're at DrupalCon, participate, study, practice, discuss, uh, find different tools and techniques to figure out how this might improve the value of what you're doing, maybe speed it up a little bit. So there are a bunch of resources here uh, from various places. I'm not going to read all these, uh, but I do have a few slides on user personas, user stories, and user mapping, of course, uh, user story mapping, uh, user flows, very good uh, diagramming sort of tools, and of course, user journey mapping. So that's it. That's <laughs> the, the end of my presentation. Uh, please definitely do take a look at uh, the slides when you do get a chance, there's the uh, link. The link was at the top of the chat too. Um, I, I posted and a few other people did too. So I'm gonna jump over to the top of the chat, and see what sort of questions we have here. Take some water. Okay, first question, aside from why my pets are so cute. I mean, they, they really are, but uh, <laughs> let's see here. Okay, first question from Chris is what are some of your favorite user behavior pattern tools? Ooh, that is that is a really good question. Um, so really, I would take a look at uh, any sort of user testing tools available. Um, I know user testing, um, I think it's usertesting.com, um, uh, Optimizely. There, there are a few different tools that are that are pretty good for studying users. I personally love uh, the, the passive study is what I call it, um, hot jar for uh, things like heat mapping and session recording and things like that. And I call them passive because I'm not directly interacting with those users. They're good for collecting data trends and validating how things work. Um, I, I think, I hope that answered your question. Uh, what tools um, do you use for page flows? Uh, so. I'll, it depends. It depends on how good I want them to look. Uh, minimally, I'll typically use Lucidchart uh, just because it's cross-platform. I use both a Mac and Windows, so I jump between the two very frequently. I, I don't like the cost of Visio personally, uh, but sometimes I'll use Affinity Designer or Illustrator uh, to make th something look a lot better, but that's a deeper investment. So uh, if it's just a rough in or a crude diagram, Lucidchart's fine. Uh, skimming down. Okay, got another question. How do you use uh, personas, user journeys, etc., when you have no data available? Would you make them up? Oh God, that is actually a really good question. Um, I, I said this earlier. You gotta do 
user research wherever possible. Uh, that can include passive research. Like I said, this is not getting direct feedback. Uh, so, so passive tools like looking at analytics to get demographic information or other behavior patterns like what pages people frequently go to, that's still telling you the truth, but you're interpreting that data. That's not the same as asking somebody directly. Uh, same thing with heat mapping. You're interpreting that data. If possible, send out a user survey. And there are lots of explanations for how to run effective uh, user surveys. You don't want to do leading questions. You don't want to introduce bias. And that's challenging. That's challenging for me and the people that I know uh, that do this sort of work. So uh, uh, user interviews are fantastic. Probably the, one of the best tools in your disposal um, if you meet resistance for that. Uh, that's OK. Uh, I, it's not preferred, but that's OK. Try to get the small wins where you can to demonstrate value, because you might be able to win that uh, fight later on to try to go get user interviews. And, and maybe even ask, why are, you, why are we resistant to talking to your users? I mean, those are the people that we're servicing here. <laughs> and, and then, of course, user testing, by far one of the best user research tools there is for something that exists. If it doesn't exist, how are you going to test it? Well, you test it along the way. Uh, and if you're doing good agile development, you're building in pieces and testing the pieces, then testing the whole at the end. Next question, uh, would you recommend doing focus groups to gather data for user journey maps? Of course. That's another great tool. Uh, I, I would contrast user interviews with focus groups, though, uh, because when you have a group mentality, sometimes you have uh, a louder and sometimes you have a quieter um, participant. That's OK. You take it for what it is. And sometimes you learn something that you wouldn't have learned in a user interview, because sometimes people are propping each other up to respond where maybe they wouldn't. So they're just two different formats. Um, and I, I, I think that's a great tool. Uh, still going down the list. A uh, few more here. So this is a long one. How many personas per audience type do you typically create? For example, if teachers are a target audience, would you have one to represent teacher persona or do you get kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, et cetera? That's a fantastic question. This is what we call sub-segmenting. A lot of times you'll start off with the high level sets that you define. So teacher, student, faculty, that might be where you're landing. And I would argue that how deeply you sub-segment really depends on what you're trying to improve. If you're trying to improve just the, the website or whatever experience you're in, it could be a hotel. Um, if you're just trying to improve the global experience, start high level. That's OK. And then drill down and use tools to find out where your focus is. So for example, a kindergarten teacher versus, say, a fourth grade teacher. Well, they have students that are a different age and have different behavior patterns. And their needs are undoubtedly different between each other. But is what you're improving something that carries that difference or not? I, I would say lead with, lead with that. Um, and I think that brings us uh, to, to one point that I try to share as much as possible. I'm sure many of you have heard this type of line of thinking, is that UX is not a module to install. Install the UX. Go install the SEO. It doesn't work that way. Just like you have a personal preference, I have a personal preference, and we have differences. We want to study use cases, and we want to introduce ethics in what it is that we're doing. But if I said, you know, I have this hotel and my, my sales are down, so I'm going to paint it. That's not UX. <laughs> that is lipstick on a pig. That is, that is completely not involving your audience at all. And that's, that's counter to a lot of those things. Now, maybe by chance you get lucky and everybody likes that new blue that you just painted your hotel. But that's not deliberate. That's trial and error. And that is an extremely expensive process. I'm largely self-taught. I know very much about uh, trial and error, and it's an extremely expensive way of doing things. So for good UX, you want to try to research your audience, find out what, what have people heard? Maybe the concierge or maybe the, the person at the booking desk or maybe somebody online has heard something. You want to get in front of those people as someone trying to make improvements. Now, you can't rely on your client to do that. You don't want to hear something second or third hand. You want to go right to the source to get to it. 
All right, uh, another question came in. Any other valuable reading material you recommend for user journey mapping and stories? So user journey mapping, I, I can't really say that there's a book uh, that I've read, but there's a lot of online materials. Just look look up the, the I know everybody Googles differently. Uh, so the sort of search terms I would look for recent things is exactly that, user journey mapping and even customer journey mapping. There's some similarities, they are slightly different. Uh, but there's so many similarities that they're virtually the same in practice and technique and tools even. Uh, user story mapping or user stories. Uh, I would highly recommend the book called, wait for it, User Story Mapping. <laughs> it's, it's an O'Reilly book. And it's, it's really good for uh, just getting right into the thick of it. Uh, if you read only the first chapter of that book, you and your team can get right into it. And the, the, the point of user story mapping is really to try to get the lay of the land and try to understand what it is that's possible. And that can change over time. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I do read a lot of, of books in this realm, if you will. One that I recently read is called How to Make Sense of Any Mess. That is, it, it touches very heavily on diagramming as a whole. And it does talk about um, these sort of mapping tools. Uh, it's a really quick read. It's maybe maybe 200 pages, a uh, real short book. But it's the type of book that helps gear you up for good information architecture, good user experience, and in general helps you become a better problem solver as a whole. If we talk out the problems, if we talk about the challenges, that's not good enough. You really want to see what things are and get everybody on the same page. That's why emphasis on diagramming is really good. As a solutions architect, I spend somewhere around 95% of my job just trying to understand what the challenges are and trying to understand people and trying to understand businesses. Coming up with solutions, I, I would contend, is the much easier part because those are just the tools in your toolkit. And if I don't know of a solution, I'm going to reach out to the whole team and say, hey, here's what the problem is. Let me frame it for you. What tools do we think are valid? And if there are multiple, you just pick one and prototype with it. Uh, another question came up. Can you restate what you were saying about learning being your primary currency? Oh, yes, I love this one. Uh, thank you for asking that. So uh, a lot of people um, would have you believe that, uh, you know, your, your budget or your uh, customer satisfaction and all those things are, are, are the thing that should drive everything. And they're not necessarily wrong. But what I would say is, you know, do some root cause analysis. You ask why, you ask why, you ask why, as many times as it takes to get to the root. And if you think of, uh, in Lean Startup, they have what's called the build, measure, learn cycle. If you've never read Lean Startup, there's another book for your list. <laughs> it's fantastic. And there are other follow-up books by Eric Reese that are really good too. Um, there's that concept of if you build a prototype and then you have measurements like KPIs or other performance measurements, those things are getting you to learn. And what are you trying to learn? Well, we're learning where it's not usable. We're learning where it's not making us money. We're learning, we're learning, we're learning. The point here is that if you can't learn, you can't address issues. You can't fail early, you fail late. And failing late is extremely counterproductive. <laughs> it's extremely expensive. And you may not even know that you're doing something wrong because you're not open to learning. But also learning as a currency is not just about improving the things that we're building, it's about improving yourself. So you just did that. You just attended a session about something that hopefully you learned uh, something as you went along. So that's, that's what I mean about learning being your primary currency. It doesn't alienate yourself from other things that are valuable. It just helps guide all of those efforts because you're opening yourself, you're being informed. Uh, one other book um, I, I just uh, came across that might help you with uh, mapping uh, user journeys, diagrams, other sort of blueprints is another O'Reilly book. Uh, it's called Mapping Experiences. So definitely check that book out. I haven't read it, but it's on the radar. Um, I think it's probably in my Amazon wish list somewhere. Uh, definitely take a look at what sort of books are available. There's a lot of information on the subject matter. One group that I really love following is uh, Nielsen Norman Group. 
Uh, I can't even tell you how many Don Norman <laughs> videos I've watched. And probably one of my favorite books of all time is uh, called The Design of Everyday Things. This should be required learning for anybody even remotely touching uh, the design field. Um, if you don't know anything about Don Norman other than what a Norman door is, go, just go look up Norman door. And you'll learn a lot about like something that propels you forward through the frustration of being a human interacting with things that are designed poorly. <laughs> and it's not on purpose. Sometimes it's aesthetic, but do I pull? Do I push? Uh, so yeah, uh, I think we got five minutes left. If anybody has any other sort of questions, happy to ask or answer them. And thank you all for the accolades. I really appreciate it. I'll be around uh, today and tomorrow. Um, if anybody wants to chat, uh, you know, I, I do this professionally, but I love talking about it. If, if you haven't noticed, um, definitely go take a look at uh, your local uh, meetups for UX. I, I go to the Baltimore one. I absolutely love the people down there. They've, they've taught me quite a bit. And a lot of this is really physical group activities, which I think we can all agree, this social distancing stuff kind of burdens those sort of practices. So, so try to find some digital analogs. I know, right? <laughs> digital equivalences to those sort of things. Like Miro um, has been brought up several times in different sessions. Mural is a similar whiteboarding tool. Just find things to be collaborative um, and try to work with people remotely safely. Uh, those sort of activities and tools. Just be visual. Don't just talk about it. Just show people. Uh, I see one last question at, at the bell. We've got how has forced WFH affected UXP efficiency? I'm not sure what WFH stands for. So I, oh, work from home. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There you go. I think we just. I think we just uh, touched that a little bit. It does hurt it. Um, it, it definitely does because I, I love using the arts and crafts sort of stuff, post-it notes, index cards, big craft paper, um, getting people physically engaged because it changes your mind. If everybody's sitting around on a, uh, on a chair, around a table, at a desk, remotely, that sort of thing, they're not engaged. But if you get them up out of their chair, physically interacting, the brain triggers in a different direction. There are ways to do that in, an, in a digital, in a remote fashion um, that you can explore, and there are ways to do that, then try to do that. Even if it just if you're just asking them, hey, look, this might seem crazy, but I'm going to ask you to maybe write a list of things on a piece of paper because I want you to physically write on a piece of paper. Stand up, do it. Seems odd. Just do it because the blood flows differently. The, the, the body is engaged. Therefore, the brain gets engaged. I'm sure you've all been at meetings where you pretty much want to fall asleep. So that's what you're trying to combat. Look at these great suggestions. I love it. I wouldn't call it a dark time in UX. I'd say it's a challenge that we're ready to face. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all very much for attending my session. I really do appreciate it. Um, think positively, support each other, and go learn as much as you can about how it is that you can improve the world.